Okay, so on 4.3 we've already talked about concavity uh, and how to use a <clears throat> second derivative sign chart uh, to determine uh, intervals of concavity, points of inflection, stuff like that. Well, this is where it gets a little bit tricky in terms of the second derivative because the way that you were going about analyzing your first derivative sign chart, remember how first derivative sign charts aren't enough, you actually have to interpret them. Well, the interpretation of that first derivative sign chart in order to um, <clears throat> identify maximum and minimum points is what's called the first derivative test. So the first derivative uh, talks about you know increasing, decreasing slope, and it identifies maxes and minimums. The second derivative test identifies maximums and minimums. Okay, so that's the tricky part about the second derivative test. Second derivative describes concavity, but the second derivative test is using the second derivative to confirm information about extrema that you got from the first derivative. So let me explain. If I have, you know, here's my cubic that I love to draw as sort of an example. That right there is a maximum point. That right there is a minimum point. Now, somewhere in there, there's going to be a point of inflection. It's about there. What do you notice about the shape that includes that maximum. <clears throat> well, that maximum is inside of an interval that is concave down. Okay. Now, this minimum right here is in an interval that is concave up. Okay. And some of you may actually be understanding what we're doing now. So what we do is we need to use the first derivative to find our critical values. And then we're going to use the second derivative instead of a first derivative sign chart to identify them as maximum and minimum points. Uh, let's do it real easy. Let's go ahead and do a, a cubic function like we have here. Uh, this one is y is equal to x cubed <clears throat> minus 5x squared plus 7x, okay? Now, y prime is 3x squared minus 10x plus 7, okay? Well, <clears throat> let's see if that actually factors. Yeah, and 7 and 1, and we're going to get, there we go, okay? So my critical values are x is equal to 7 thirds and x is equal to 1. Well, I happen to know that that's a cubic with a leading coefficient uh, that's positive. So my end behavior is, gonna, is going to ensure that the graph looks something like this. x is equal to 1 is smaller, so it's the maximum. x is equal to 7 thirds is, the, is to the right. It's larger along the x-axis, so it's going to be this minimum right here. But here's the thing, that I know. So basically what I'm saying is that x is equal to 1 because I know ahead of time, which I usually won't, but this is a training wheels question. x is equal to 1 if it's that maximum <clears throat> is in an interval that is concave down. And therefore, if I take the second derivative and I get 6x minus 10, then y double prime of 1 is going to be 6 minus 10 or negative 4. The second derivative at that critical value is negative. And therefore that's saying that that critical value occurs in a concave down interval. If it's a critical value and it occurs in an interval that is concave down, it's a maximum, <clears throat> okay? And therefore, what we need to do is we just need to, you know, figure out negative, figure out what one is, and it's one 
minus 5 is negative 4 plus 7 is positive 3. So that means that 1, 3 is your maximum point. Okay, well, we should know that 7 thirds is going to give us a positive value. <clears throat> Thankfully, uh, this is going to be a little bit easy. 6 and the 3 cancel, leaving 14 minus 10 or positive 4. That means that the critical value of 7 thirds happens in an interval that is concave up. And if it happens in an interval that is concave up, then it's a minimum point. Okay? And do you see how you use the first derivative to find the critical values, and you're going to use the second derivative in lieu of a first derivative sign chart in order to actually find out what those values are, whether they're maximums, whether they're minimums, or they actually could be neither, okay? <clears throat> and I'll get to that here in just a second. But if we want to plug 4 into here, 4 cubed is going to be 64, okay? 5 times 16 is going to be 80, so 64 minus 80 is going to be negative 16, okay? Negative 16 plus 28 is going to be 12, okay? So 14, 12 is going to be, oh, and I messed that up somewhere, but, but you, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't be plugging in 4, that's the output, we should be plugging in 7 thirds, sorry. Uh, I was concentrating so much on my explanation, uh, trying to make sure I got that straight that I, uh, <laughs> that I messed up there. So, and of course that's going to be a little bit messy because you're cubing a fraction and stuff like that, but this is going to be our minimum value, okay? So there are two ways, once you get critical values from the first derivative, there are two ways to identify whether those critical values are maximum, minimum values, or neither. One of them is by a first derivative sign chart and then interpreting it by the first derivative test like we've seen. The next one, the other way of doing it, is using the second derivative to determine the concavity of the interval in which the critical value occurs. And the concavity in which that critical value occurs will tell you whether it's concave up, concave down, or neither. Okay? Now, I said, or neither. Okay? Well, let's go back to our old friend y is equal to x cubed y is equal to x cubed looks like this. Now it has a critical value at 0, 0, right? And that critical value at x is equal to 0 is because it actually does come up and lay flat right here at the origin, just for a split second. So it goes positive slope, positive slope, positive slope, 0 slope, positive slope, positive slope, positive slope. But that is not an extreme point. That is neither a maximum or a minimum. That is actually a point of inflection because it's a critical value for the second derivative as well. So if we get a critical value for the first derivative that gives us zero when we evaluate it using the second derivative test, it's, it's, it's not a maximum or a minimum value, okay? And of course, if it's undefined, it winds up being uh, sort, of in, sort of indeterminate. You can't really determine what's going on, okay? So let's go ahead and do a couple more examples that are a little bit more difficult. Uh, let's, go, let's go back to our old friend, the serpentine curve. How about y is equal to 4x over x squared plus 1? <clears throat> y prime is the bottom uh, times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. Okay? Oh, sorry. Got to actually square it. So this numerator right here is going to be 4x squared plus 4 minus 8x squared over x squared plus 1 squared. 
which is going to give me, when I factor the 4 out, it's going to give me 4, 1 minus x squared over x squared plus 1 squared. Now that is going to give me first derivative critical values at 1 and negative 1, okay? <clears throat> but instead of, and I've done a problem either identical to this or remarkably similar to this, and what I mean by remarkably similar, if it wasn't 4x over x squared plus 1, it was just a different, um, it was just a different coefficient other than 4. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and find y double prime. Okay, let's go ahead and do it by the quotient rule. And so we know that it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top. And I'm going to do it as, you know, 4. I'm going to loop the 4 in with that instead of leaving it as a coefficient. So the derivative of negative 4x squared is negative 8x. Okay. Now, the top, uh, 4 minus 4x squared, and we'll sort of... Uh, times the derivative of the bottom. So 2x squared plus 1 times 2x, all of that over x squared plus 1 to the fourth. And I know, of course, that a lot of that is going to cancel out. Okay. Now, I know this gives me negative 8x cubed minus 8x uh, that negative right there, um, let's go ahead and actually put it inside here. Uh, that's a negative 4, and I know it's going to be multiplied by 2 and 2x. So that winds up being negative 16x. And then that 4x squared is going to be multiplied by 4 and 2x. So 4x squared times 4x is going to be 16x cubed. <laughs> and this right here, <clears throat> this is going to give me 8x cubed minus 24x over x squared plus 1 cubed. And the second derivative is going to be 8x times x squared minus 3 over x squared plus 1 cubed. Now here's the thing. I, I don't really even need to get a value for the second derivative at 1 and negative 1, right? Now that I've gotten this, I simply just need to determine whether it's going to be positive, okay? So y double prime of negative 1 and y double prime of 1, is it going to be, what's its relationship to 0? Well, let's go ahead and plug it in. If I plug in, well, everything in the denominator is going to be positive, so I'm really not worried about that. So if I plug in a negative 1 here, negative 1 squared is 1, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, okay? That negative 2 times a negative 8 is going to be positive, so that is going to be greater than 0. Same thing is going to occur when you plug in 1, except it's going to be a positive 8 out here, so that's going to be less than 0. So this means that it's concave up at negative 1, okay? If it's concave up at negative 1, then you have a minimum at negative 1, okay? Just remember what this function actually looks like, uh, and it's nice to actually do one that you know what it looks like. This function looks kind of like that. So at negative 1, it's definitely going to be concave up, right? And therefore, negative 1 concave up, that's a minimum. You know that at 1, it's going to be concave down. And therefore, that is going to be a maximum. Okay? So all you're doing here is you're using the second derivative instead of a first derivative sign chart in order to determine the nature of your critical values. Okay? Uh, I'll probably only do... I mean, here's the thing. Second derivative test is actually really, really easy. Um, I mean, the hard part is obviously sometimes just, you know, doing the differentiation to get the second derivative. The hard part about second derivative test is doing it enough times to get over what it's called. Now, I find the, I find the naming of the second derivative test to be the most unfortunate thing. Because 
you associate the first derivative and its critical values with extrema. So the first derivative test should be about extrema. Uh, you associate the second derivative and a second derivative sign chart with concavity. But the second derivative test is not about points of inflection. The second derivative test is another way to discern extrema. And that's the hardest part to remember, but once you actually get that straight in your head, it's smooth sailing, and actually the, the mechanics of it wind up being rather simple. So I'll go ahead and do one more video on this, and then I'll probably get going on some 4.7 stuff, some uh, optimization, uh, maximum uh, word problems. Bye.